Thanks for coming. I know it's a, kind of a different thing uh, with the COVID and stuff. Uh, we didn't know how many people were going to be here, but uh, a nice little crowd here. So glad everybody can make it. Got some new faces here. So hopefully everybody can learn good here on what's going on and help them get through your hives and keep your bees alive. So um, my name is Richard Vondro. I'm the president of North Isle Beekeepers Club. Back there on the camera is Madison Rowe. Ciao. Ralph, Ralph, sorry. Now she's our secretary. Uh, Veronica Vondro in the back of Tim. She's our, our club queen here. And Tim Stumo, he's our past president. So, uh, everybody get a chance to sign up for the door prizes and a raffle back there. So, if you haven't gotten a chance yet, just go ahead and sign up. So, back there, the, the raffle prizes there, it's $1 per chance. It's kind of what it does is kind of help, help offset. So we don't have any dues, so everybody kind of put a little buck in there and stuff like that and do the raffle price and make a little money off of it to help us at uh, some of our costs. So, uh, uh, anybody is willing to donate uh, a raffle prize or a door prize, uh, more to the door prize. Today our door prize was supposed to be uh, a mic check, but uh, Pat and Peggy uh, aren't feeling good, so they're not going to make it, so we don't have it, so whoever wins it, we're going to have an IOU for them. So, but if you have anybody that wants something or has something that you can put up for the door prize, get a hold yep. of me. Uh, we'll just keep bringing stuff. So I think Pat and Peggy are going to actually bring something for our December meeting, I believe, that they're just going to bring out your basket of things. So whatever you want to do, if you find something. So that'd be great. Um, hope have you, everybody had a good summer, good harvest. So, uh, like I said, if you got any questions, can we get going through here before, after? Uh, yeah, because Sean, uh, it's up to you if you want to ask questions when you're doing presentation. Sure. If you want to wait till the end, okay. it's up to you. So, we've got a, I think we've got a smaller crowd. Email. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, this year we're going to do a little different. We're going to meet every month again, like we have been, but we're actually going to continue it through the summer. Uh, we talked a little bit that. Uh, winter's great, you learn a lot, but you're not in the beehives. So we're going to continue it through the summer so people get a chance to meet. Uh, I know there's lots of questions at that time. Uh, so we get a chance to get everybody to get together. You can ask your questions and stuff like that. The only month we're not going to meet is August. That is our basically extracting time and Iowa State Fair time. So we're not going to meet in August. Um, uh, the meetings in our May one. Uh, instead of being the second Tuesday of the month, we're going to be meeting on May 14th. It'll be a Saturday. It'll be a field day at uh, Pat and Peggy's, PMP Honey, down at Cadell. Kind of like we did last year. We get to go in and sit down and talk about stuff and we're going to go into beehives and actually look into beehives and talk about splits and what you're looking for in a hive and stuff like that. So that'll be the only one we won't have a, an actual meeting meeting. It'll be, it'll be the field day. Our North Coast East Fellows auction in April 23rd. This is down. Again, we're going to have another, another auction like we have. So it gives you a little time to think okay. about if you've got any things you want to sell. Uh, kind of keep track. We'll, we won't start a list right at the present time. Can we get probably after the first few years, then we'll start, our, start getting the list going. But it gives you a chance to. Get through your equipment, and if you want to sell something or whatever, you can get around or up and hang on to it, and then we'll get going. So, uh, also, we are also looking for a vice president yet. Uh, if anybody wants to step up, uh, basically the role of what is going for vice president, and then then you'll step up into the president position after that. So, but uh, if anybody wants to step up and uh, be a vice president, we help with the meetings, help us coordinate stuff. Uh, different events we do and things like that. So if anybody's interested, get a hold of me, or if you want to, get a hold of Madison, or shoot her an email or whatever, and we'll, we'll get in touch with you. So, uh, okay. Anybody has any other speakers? I got a pretty good number of speakers lined up. If you know anybody that you have heard or seen somewhere else speaking that would think they do a good job, uh, get a hold of me. And we'll see if we can get in contact with them and see what they can do. So we got a good share of the speakers already lined up, but there was always a couple spots left. So uh, okay. 
Anybody got anything else for the present time? No talk about bring up anything? <coughs> I just want to uh, tip my hat to Madison back here for keeping us all focused, keeping us networked and connected to the email. She's done a great job on uh, Facebook emails. I love auctions. She's been, uh, if we her, uh, a lot of that stuff won't happen. So, so anything else? Well, now we're going to turn it over to Sean, Sean Johnson. So he'll be our speaker for tonight, and he'll talk a little bit about himself. And uh, if you got any questions, just let him know. You bet. So okay. So my email up address up there that I, if you if you want to get in contact with me, I suggest writing it down. You probably will want to get in contact with me because one of the things I'm going to talk about at the very very end is a different educational opportunity that um, our association is going to do uh, next summer about clean burning. So if you're at all interested in that, I'm going to talk about that after we're done with this. And you'll want to get in contact with me about details about that class that we're going to do next summer. We're, we're trying to do it kind of as a regional thing um, because we know there's a lot of people who are probably interested in that. So I am originally from Rolf, West Bend area. I spent most of my life on a farm. I uh, moved to back to Spencer area in 2015, or 2014 and moved into the city of Spencer in June of 2015. I worked at Spencer Hospital as a systems analyst. I've been in computer and IT related stuff well, for most of my adult life. <laughs> I started beekeeping in the early 2000s. Um, there was a course that was offered in Spencer uh, by the uh, well, it was Iowa Honey Producers Association as well as the um, Iowa State Extension Office there in Spencer, and me and several other people who took that class started the Northwest Iowa Beekeepers Association. There was about fifteen people in the class, and we all really got into it, and we started it. Um, that was in the early 2000s. I moved away for about eight years and moved, moved to Southeast Iowa, Fairfield, if anybody knows where that's at. Um, I taught classes down there, started another association there, taught a whole bunch of beekeepers there, and then, as I already mentioned, moved back. Um, I've been one of our primary instructors for our club, along with Tim Olson, who is our club president. Um, so I've done a lot of teaching over the last 15 years doing this. So um, even though I didn't have a lot of time to put this presentation together, I could stand and talk about bees for two hours just off the cuff. So, but I wanted something that kind of people could follow along. <laughs> I currently have 13 colonies. I use mostly double nukes. Everybody know what a double nuke is? Double nuke is has the same footprint as a 10 frame colony, except it's two four frames separated by a piece of wood in the middle. So it's basically having two colonies side by side. Uh, uses a lot less equipment. They overwinter, in my experience, they overwinter much better in that because they're sharing a wall. And it also, for me, it's less space and a lot less equipment. I've got you know, 13 hives, and all but one of them is in double nuke. So, you know, it takes up the space of six regular colonies. So that's part of the reason why I do it. Um, so I'm going to show you real quick here. Like I said, I'm at Spencer. We do most of our meetings here. Our president from our association is Blair here in Laverne. We have members in Cherokee, Storm Lake. Emmitsburg, lots of people in the Spirit Lake area, uh, Wichita, uh, even some people come from Sheldon, Orange City. So we're a pretty sprawled out group. And I think we're similar size to you guys because we've had meetings where there's been 40 to 50 people, and overall there's close to 100 members. So we got we got a pretty good. Uh, thank God, I think you guys do too. It looks like this is a pretty good sized club. So, 
Um, so but that's kind of my background. Um, I'm not, I don't do this professionally, I just do it as a volunteer, so, uh, but I've been doing it for a while. Uh, for the presentation tonight, I've got some sources of information that I've shared with you. I'm just, a lot of this stuff I know, but I still reference, even somebody like me who teaches and been doing this for almost 20 years, I still reference a lot of other people's works to get information. So, uh, our association, I, and uh, one more thing I want to just point out is again, I talked with uh, Rich on Thursday, so I'm sure there's plenty of spelling errors and stuff in this, so in front of the judge, I'm not a great one, it's a good one. Oh, I see one already, I misspelled Megan Milbrath's name, uh, but she's um, a great resource, she has sandhillbees.com, she is part of the Be Informed Partnership, our club uses a lot of her information when we teach. Um, Randy Oliver, Scientific Beekeeping, is another great source that we use for teaching. Um, of course, University of Minnesota, uh, when we teach our first year and second year course, we use the um, Beekeeping in Northern Climate Manual from University of Minnesota. Uh, there's also some information from Dr. Samuel, Dr. Samuel Ramsey, who is a uh, doctor of etymology and a research scientist. If you haven't heard of him, hopefully I'll enlighten you a little bit on that. <laughs> and of course, like I said, we talk about stuff from our association, so I have a lot of other resources from that already to, to do. Um, I guess one more thing I want to do real quick as a show of hands, just to get an idea of what the experience of some of the people are here. Raise your hand if you've only been keeping bees for about a year. Okay, so we do have some new people. Two to three years. Okay, and then four and beyond. Okay, so a lot, a lot of experienced beekeepers, about half, and everybody else is, the other half is, okay. Just trying to gauge the, the knowledge level of it. So, um, I'm going to talk about winter preparation and winter bees. Um, that was actually to go back to the actual title, winter bees. We're going to actually talk about what that what a winter bee actually is, as well as um, how to get ready for your bees ready for winter. So I tried to come up with a little catchy way to do this. So. Three C's are condensed, combined, and crowned. So, condensed colonies, if you've got big colonies that have five, four or five hive bodies on them, you want to get them down to uh, two or three deeps, uh, or if you use mediums, three. Uh, the smaller volumes are easier for the bees to keep warm. Um, and it's lower surface area for the heat. Uh, Combine weaker colonies with stronger colonies. I just did this this last week. Um, I had some colonies that I uh, did late summer splits with them and they just were struggling. So I actually had 14, that's why I'm down to 13 because one of them was just struggling and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to combine it with another good strong colony. Um, and to do that, you want the, you need to make the other colony queenless, which I did, um, leave them that way. Put a little bit of newspaper over the um, the stronger queen right colony, stick them on top of there, and let them uh, get used to each other's smell over the course of a couple of days. <coughs> Haven't had a chance to follow up on that. We'll see how it works. Usually, usually that works quite a bit of the time. And then, so that's combined and crowned. What I mean by crowning the colonies with with honey is how you configure the, the honey frames in the, uh, the hive. So if you've got standard 10 frame stuff, your bottom frame is going to have outside, outside the honey, and then the whole top should be pretty much full of honey. That sounds like a lot of honey, but in northern Iowa, you're going to need 8 to 12 frames of honey anyway. And, and they don't all have to be full. Um, a lot of I mean, bees don't always fill frames out. That's why I say 8 to 12 because 
you can have some partially filled framed honey. I mean, I, I do. I don't, not all my bees fill out every frame of honey all the way to the very edge. So you're trying to look for that equivalent of uh, 80 to 100 pounds, and you're trying to gauge it also on the side of the colony that you're pushing it in, too. And then, in all those cases, and, and well, and I'll also talk about one other way that I do it, since I use double nukes, is I do it kind of the same way. I usually do my double nukes over when I'm in 3, 3D, which is actually only 12 frames. It's uh, four in each side, 3D. So that top one is all honey, and then the outside middle one is honey, and then it's mirrored on the other side. So that's how I run it for my winter configuration for my double loops, which still ends up being 10 frames of honey. But it's only, but you're getting two colonies through a winter on 10 frames of honey instead of uh, for a single colony. Now I did have, you do have to buy special equipment for all that. So there's, it's the, if you already started out with 10 frame, I'm not trying to push that, but it's, it's actually really good to have these as what we call a resource colony. But that's a whole other type of subject. Any questions about that? Condensing, combining, and grounding. Why would you put honey on the outside of the frame? I would think that that would be a cold. Well, what, I, to the outside. what you're trying to do, so the, the colony is going to cluster in one. But what you're trying to do is get it so that cluster is going to be surrounded by honey. So if you're going to Two, uh, two high body configuration, they're going to start out in that lower yeah. high body, and the bees are going to work up as the winter goes on. Right. So you've got honey here, honey here. And then those middle eight frames, you're going to want at least a couple of uh, decent pollen frames in there, because they're still they're going to need that uh, later in the winter when they try to raise brood again. So you're basically giving surrounding them with honey so that when it gets cold, they don't end up getting isolated from the honey in the colony. Because you can have a situation where you still have plenty of honey in the colony, but it gets too cold and then the bees can't move off of it uh, while they're in deep, hard, cl tight cluster. They just, that's, that's, you don't want that situation. So this, this makes it less likely that it's going to happen. Do I pull my frames on the bottom if they're honey bound or get too much honey? Do you pull? Yeah, I would. Yeah, pull them. yeah. Pull them. In. I mean, if you at this point in the year, I just start moving any honey frames up to the top. If you if you've got honey down in any of the lower frames, just start moving them up. That's what I've been doing basically since August when I yeah. honey harvested. I just keep, whenever I go out and work them. If I find a, uh, a frame of honey that's at least 50, 60 percent full of honey, I just move it up. Three or four frames are enough down there on the bottom, aren't they? Yeah, well, you don't actually you don't need it. You don't really need anything down below. I, I don't think. Other questions? Do you, when do you generally pull off your honey? Like, do I, you have a certain day or? No, I, what I do though, because we, in Spencer, we also have this thing that people probably have heard about called the Clay County Fair, which is in the second week of September. And so I usually harvest mid-August, mid to late August, so that I have time to get honey off to have available for the fair. Um, and honestly, the way things are going with, uh, we're going to talk, unfortunately, we're going to talk a lot about mites later. Um, it's also a really good time to start treating for mites once you pull your honey supers off because literally everything but Formic Pro you can't use with honey supers on. So pulling, your, I mean it sounds really early to do it mid-August or, or third week of August, but it also gives the bees that much more time to build up for the winter. So, good question. Any other questions before I move on? Yeah. Um, this might be a question for after the meeting, but I have, uh, I got a hive uh, 
from a guy that was getting out of the bee business. Mm -hmm. This year, he kept the hive uh, for the whole summer, but he didn't really do much with it. I think he neglected it most of the time, so I think it's warmed. Um, and it's a very small hive that's pretty weak, I think. There's not very many bees in there. Um, and he also had a queen excluder on top of the, the two deeps. And then he only had one super on the, the whole summer, and I got it in the end of July. Huh. Um, and so the queen, I think, I didn't go all the way to the bottom just because it was so packed full of honey and bird comb and things like that. Um, also being a new beekeeper, I was afraid I was going to kill the queen <laughs> trying to get all these frames out. Um, but uh, so what would you recommend for the winter for a wheat hive that had the excluder on there so that I think the queen could only lay a certain amount of brood uh, the rest of the summer? And yeah, so this so sounds it's like trapped, they we're trapped with tons of honey and not very much room for brood. It sounds like they could have gotten honey bound. Okay. And, and they, I mean, and if you really didn't go down and look, it's very likely that they swarmed. Okay. Okay. Um, so hopefully you still have a, you know, hopefully if they swarm, they, I mean, that I'm just looking at that as a, a, a likely scenario, not that it absolutely happened, but if they swarm, hopefully your bees were able to raise a new queen. But that also. If you already have a kind of a wheat colony to begin with, that late in the year, um, I mean, I did splits in up until July 29th. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you got to give them brood. So that was that would have been the other thing too is that you really did need to get in there to so see how the other action was because a weak and struggling queen, if you put two frames of brood in there, it'll just explode. I mean, it. You, you can have a wheat colony even in mid to late July bloom if you can give them some brood from a from a good established colony. Okay. You also, if it's all honey bound, you got to get them honey frames out because she's yeah. got to have some place to lay. Yeah. And if it's all full of honey, she's got no place to lay. Is it too late now though to um, do something like that, or is she still? Yeah, it's, we're, the honey season is pretty much over. So yeah. So it's, 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 it's too late for, for her to make fruit now. Yeah. There's. The, we did see some bees coming down. into my hives with pollen on their legs, but I wasn't sure how often that happens. Have you been given any pollen patties or anything? No, I wasn't able to get any pollen patties anywhere, but I, I've been doing sugar water ever since uh, September. Okay. You really need pollen though, too. Okay. Do so. you have another company that you could you could combine those? I have with. two hives uh, that are owned by the camp I work at, okay. and then I got this hive for from a guy who's getting out of the business. And that's going to be my personal hive, but right now I'm just wondering if it's even going to survive the winter. So, well, it sounds like they have plenty of honey. Yep. So, but are they going to be able to stay warm with such a small amount of bees? Yeah, you're going to have to go in and actually just go in and look. Yeah, okay. you're going to have to you know. get a better estimate on because okay. larger colonies do cluster better and have a better chance of survival. Although I've heard, I mean, been doing this for almost 20 years and heard lots of stories about. Really small clusters of bees making it through as well. Mm -hmm. um, the other big consideration, which again I'll talk about a lot more later, unfortunately, are varroa mites. So your varroa count is also really important <coughs> for that hive. Yeah, that guy who I got the hive from didn't believe in treating for a yeah, mice, so, so yeah, he, probably he didn't part really that I struggled. You, you probably don't want to join it with your other hive. Yeah, I would, you, you, you would definitely want to do a mic check before you did that. Okay. okay. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and move on to, we, I kind of talked about this already, so make it queenless, reduce your uh, weaker colony to 10 frames, uh, giving priority to brood, pollen stores, honey, and drawn comb. But you also want to make sure that that colony has treated diseases or mites, as the case may be. So yes, this kind of goes right into your question. If you're going to combine that colony, this is what you want to do. Um, and then you prepare the stronger colony by placing a piece of newspaper over the top, whatever your top high body is, um, and place the weaker one on top. And check back in a couple days, and it's usually, it's not 100% foolproof, but it's pretty close doing the newspaper method. That's what people have done for a long time, and it works great. Um, the three Vs, uh, Victual, which I had to look up 
as a uh, synonym for the word food, ventilation, and varroa. Uh, but I'm going to talk about victual and food in a way that probably a lot of you have never ever heard about before. Um, so besides your eight to or eighty to hundred pounds of honey, um, eight to I should say twelve frames for a uh, ten frame colony. And then, like I said, I use 40 to 50 pounds for my double nukes. Uh, honey should be dry. Um, the definition of honey is it's 18.6% moisture or less. Uh, honey can be as dry as 16% moisture. That doesn't happen too often, but you can have really dry honey. Um, but when you're, if, even at 16% moisture, if you have 100 pounds of water, or 100 pounds of honey, that's still, 16 pounds of water, or about two gallons of water. So as the bees eat the honey, they uh, the, the water vapor is given off as they eat it. So that water vapor has to have a place to go. And this is water that they're going to produce no matter what. This isn't counting other water vapor that can get in from humidity and other sources. So this is why we talk about ventilation as being one of the most important things. Um, ventilation. And, and wet, cold bees kills bees more than lack of food. Um, so as, as they eat the, the honey and the moisture is released, it's got to have a place to get out. Um, we actually, in our club, we actually don't even recommend using um, an entrance reducer on, on any of ours. Wide open. And, and a lot of people do the same thing. Um, other people even use screen, keep their screen bottom boards on and open all winter long. I didn't put a, the, I couldn't find it again, but I found something where I was using this. They did an experiment in the 1970s with a couple of, col or several colonies of bees where basically they built hive bodies that were completely screened. That's all they were. There was no wood on the outside, it was just screens. And they tried to overwinter them in that. And they survived until January when they had a really bad snowstorm and a lot of wind. So um, the caveat of that whole thing is when bees cluster, they actually act just like any other animal in the wild. As long as they're out of the wind, they can take the cold. Their, their bodies are fuzzy, so they get in that tight cluster. It's like, like a beaver or a goose or something like that. I mean, those animals live without having any shelter to go into. You know, they find some place that's out of the wind and they survive. Same is true with, with honeybees. You know, European honeybees are, by their nature, designed to be able to survive in the cold weather. As long as they can get into a tight cluster and stay out of the wind and be not covered in water, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna do really well. Um, but this is why uh, controlling varroa before winter is, cr is as critical as anything else. If you, if you make sure they have plenty of honey, you've got good ventilation, you've got moisture control, um, you got mouse guards in place, um, all that good stuff. The bees were really strong going into winter. If you've got too much of varroa, your, your chances are that colony still isn't going to make it. Um, and part of the reason for that is the other food, the other victual, is actually stored in the bodies of what are called the winter bees um, in a form of what's called fat body tissue. I don't know if anybody heard of that before. Yeah, so we're going to get into a little more to that. But winter bees exposed to varroa have had this tissue damaged because that's actually what varroa feeds on. For over 50 years, we were told varroa is like a tick. It feeds on the hemolyph or the blood of the bee. Um, <laughs> back in 2017, uh, Samuel Ramsey, the guy I referenced earlier, did a research project on this, and he found out, no. Um, the reason why beekeepers don't normally see 
mites on bees is because they actually feed on the bottom side of the bee, which is where the fat body tissues are at. Bees that are coming out right now have been fed upon by varroa, well, it's damaged that tissue. So this is why colonies that have too many varroa tend to collapse in January or February or March because that's when the colony starts to try to rear brood again and they can't. And they can't because there's no fat body tissue for those winter bees to be able to start producing royal jelly. And all the other damage that um, varroa does to the, to the bees as well. Um, so having varroa counts of less than 2%, which is the standard way to do a, a varroa check is to measure out a half a cup of bees. Somebody did this a, long, a while back. They figured out 300, there's 300 bees in a half a cup. And you want a sample size of 300 because it's a lot more accurate than counting just 100. So then you just divide the number of mites you count by three, and that's your raw percentage. And so my threshold is at about five mites in a 300 mite or 300 bee check. That's about my threshold for it. Might be time to treat this colony, and especially um, going into August, September, <coughs> October, you want it at that level or below. Um, 3% or less might still be viable for the winter, and you could develop a treat with oxalic acid over the winter. Higher mite counts, especially if you get into the 5% range or more, it's very likely that even though that colony may look great, otherwise it may have lots of bees, might have tons of honey, might be looking great. That colony, as the um, winter population starts to die off, you'll end up having almost as many mites in the colony as you have bees. And again, that's a big problem in January and February when that colony tries to start raising brood again. So, Sean, let me get this straight. After 14 years of using that mite and tick comparison, I was wrong. <laughs> yep. We were all well, I taught it for 15 years. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, it was just very recently that this... This came out. That's fascinating, yeah. Yeah. I, I hope, I didn't ever connect this to the internet, so I might have to try to do that. Um, but if anybody can get a notepad, look up Samuel Ramsey's uh, three minute thesis on it. So it's, he, it's, he's a fascinating speaker. They had him two years ago at the Iowa Honey Producers, Iowa Honey Producers Association annual meeting. He is a fantastic speaker. Um, and <coughs> besides the little short three-minute thesis about raw ventilation and food. Have you done three treatments of, of oxalic acid yet? Um, that, I wouldn't recommend doing three treatments. Um, it's, you're really only supposed to do it about two or, well, in a year you might be able to do three treatments, but it's totally off-label to do more than one treatment every few months. It's not really designed. Um, I mean, people do it. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's off-label and it's not recommended by anybody who, who teaches beekeeping to do anything other than dribble method or um, vaporization method. And to do it one time, usually in late winter, or early spring to do kind of a cleanup. So like, that's part, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but if you're in that, if you're below 2%, you probably don't need to treat. You can if you want. Some people just treat prophylactically, which is fine. If you're in that 3% to 5% range, um, I would strongly recommend doing oxalic acid dribble um, at some point in the, in the fall and winter. To, to try to clean up and get those mite counts down so that when they get into raising brood again in January and February that there isn't a whole bunch of mites to go into the, um, the brood right away. So on your uh, hives you just keep a mulch guard on it and you pull the bottom board out completely? Yeah, it, well, <laughs> double nibs have a much different opening. It's much narrower and smaller. 
Um, and all my double loops do have uh, solid boards. But, um, but I put uh, extra holes in the sides of the, uh, yeah, the, the high bodies as well to keep airflow going. But um, on my 10 frame, I keep the screen bottom board on year round and I leave the, um, the front open. Actually, I'm going to talk about that in the next one for what I do for mouse control. Yeah. So, um, so the bees I got, I got two nukes, uh, and then I, they came pre-treated for mites. Mm -hmm. And then I treated it with formic acid in uh, yeah, pro. Uh, yeah. August. Okay. August or September, I think September, beginning of September. That's a good, that's a really good time to treat because that's when the bees are going to start producing their, their winter bees. Okay, I have not done oxalic acid and I haven't done any mite checks. Okay. Uh, and so, other than doing the mite check, uh, when do you do the oxalic? Uh, I'll talk, I'll talk about it. Okay. Yep. okay. It's in, it's all coming, coming up. Yeah. Do you use like a moisture box on top of your hives or, or not? Yes. So again, I'm going to talk about that too. Okay. It's in, like it's in the next one. <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to go a little more about winter bees and fat bodies and a compound that's called vito, <coughs> vitelogenin. Vitogelin. Yeah. Sure it is. That's, fact. that's how you say it. Um, so they don't just store honey and pollen. This is part of the, the thing that kind of was an eye opener for me when I did more research on what fat body tissue really is. Um, they do, bees do store some protein in the form of pollen and bee bread, which they try to keep, but the majority of it that they actually need and use for brood grain is actually stored in their bodies in the fat body tissue and this uh, vitellogenin is the substance that, that when they eat honey and pollen, that helps them convert those resources into fat body tissues, which are mostly made of protein, actually. They call it fat body tissue, but there's, it's also filled with proteins and enzymes and um, even hormones. Um, so summer bees use this when they first hatch. Uh, they, they, this is how they build it up. Like I said, about five days after they hatch, they build up fat body tissue so that they can become nurse bees. And then they also use that. One of the other things I've read about that I didn't know, you know, this is what's great about beekeeping, we do it for 20 years and still learn new stuff all the time. The, the newly emerged bees also feed the worker foraging bees because they're too busy working, they don't eat. So I, I always knew that worker bees fed the queen, but a lot of the foraging bees also get fed by the nurse bees. And that also draws upon the fat body tissues that they have. So that's the other reason why in the summer there's not a lot of fat body tissue in any of the bees because it gets depleted right away. So they use it in feeding the brood, they use it in feeding the queen, they use it in feeding the, the foraging workers. So it gets, it gets used up right away. But because the winter bees don't need, don't need to nurse, and there's no longer any foraging activity, all that energy is stored. And it's there till the end of winter. So not a really great picture uh, in this light, but as you see, that's the, the slide that looks at the fat body tissues of a summer bee on the left and a winter bee on the right. And you can just see how much more dense that white substance is in the body. And it's, that's basically where it is. It's on the, the thorax of the bee. Um, it surrounds, that tissue surrounds them. And again, this is exactly where the, the varroa mite goes to eat when it's feeding on a bee. It basically, um, it sticks its uh, you know, probe into the body of the bee. It squirts some stuff in there to liquefy the 
the fat body tissues, and then it sucks it back up. It's pretty disgusting. <laughs> but hey, that's what you do when you're a mite, I guess. So, again, fat body is not body fat. It's, it's qualitatively different than just fat tissue. Um, it's considered an organ itself, and it functions like a liver in mammals. So this is one of the questions I had for a long time too, is it's like, well bees don't have a liver, so what do they do when they encounter a pesticide or a herbicide or a toxin on the environment? They don't they don't have a liver to clean it up like like mammals and we do. So how does that how do they do that? Well, the fat body tissues are what do that. So again, all this talk about how pesticides are ruining our bees, well, it's true, except if they had their fat body tissue, they'd probably be okay. It's, to me, everything keeps circling back to the damn varroa mite. It's basically the source of just about every problem that we have with bees, whether it's pesticides, uh, diseases, colony collapse, all that stuff. It, it circles, keeps circling around Varroa, and especially what it does to the fat body tissue. So, um, because it has protein, glyco glycogen, mitochondria, uh, and enzymes. It helps them detoxify when they're exposed to pesticides. Um, the fat body tissues functions are, they, it's, it's used um, while they're also in the larval stage that, um, to help them regulate their metamorphosis. Uh, it regulates their hormones, osmosis, regulation of water, temperature regulation, and immune response. So the osmosis and temperature regulation are also key factors of why varroa fed upon bees are less likely to survive the winter because they get exposed to water, they can take in water which could kill them. If they can't regulate their temperature very well, they're going to die. And immune response is the other big one because if you've been fed upon by a varroa and you're a honeybee, unfortunately you don't have a body that heals itself like a mammal does. So you're left with a hole in your belly after that varroa feeds on you. Just a hole. And it's, it's going to be there until you die which is probably not going to be that long because now you, any sort of disease organism that's in the colony can get in that hole and you can get deformed wing virus, you can get which you can spread to other bees, you can get nosema, you can be exposed to uh, fungi and send the hive, and it all can just come right through that hole in your body because it's been left there by a varroa that fed upon you. And since your fat body tissue was eaten upon, you have a really weak immune response to it. So you're just kind of screwed. So, like I said, this is the, I don't think I have this joined to the internet, so I don't think I can open this link. But it's called Treatment Thesis by Samuel Ramsey. Definitely worth watching. Goes into even more detail about this if you're interested about how parole works. Um, the three M's, mice, moisture, and medications. So mice can be a big problem. Um, you can buy the regular mouse guards, but what we actually recommend in our club is to buy a quarter inch hardware cloth, and you basically just fold it in half, stick it in the opening, and it's big enough, the, the openings are big enough to let them be through, but too small for a mouse, and then it also keeps it open for ventilation and moisture control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Just a hardware cloth. What's hardware cloth? Um, like screen chunks of yeah, chunks of wire that are yeah, sewn together in a mesh. Some say a half inch works too. Um, half inch would probably still work, but there are some mice that can probably still get through that. Yeah. Um, Moisture control, uh, we were talked about what you should use, what you should use for moisture control. So besides ventilation, you're still going to have moisture in the colony um, and you want a way to absorb some of that moisture 
or have a, uh, give it a place to go. I mean, you want to try to get most of it to vent out, but it's, it's an imperfect world, and you're gonna, probably still going to have some problems. One of the other things, too, um, I, we didn't really talk about this yet, but winter feeding, you know, we talk about using two-to-one sugar syrup. Everybody knows what that is, right? Um, you should be feeding that now. If you're not feeding it now, get started. If you got weak colonies, get that going. Because you want to go pull that off here pretty soon. As the days get shorter and cooler, they have to have time to dry that syrup off. So um, I made the mistake of feeding too late in the winter, and I had winter kill because there was just too much moisture in the colony. It, even though I was ventilating like crazy, um, I did. And, and that's also the reason why I've done, uh, I've switched from using the the, tr the trough style frame replacement feeders, which I had been using to just putting a big chicken waterer out, basically fill it with two to one sugar syrup and let the bees self feed and let them put it in place. They can regulate a lot better how quickly they can store it and dry it than I can by putting a <laughs> one gallon feeder in there and saying, go for it girls. Um, the other thing too that I think works really well is to place what's called a feeding shim immediately above um, your top frame. And so really all it is is a piece of board, a half inch to an inch thick, that's the same dimension as your high body. And so it just it creates a space an inch and a half or so right above the frames of your top of your high. And then as winter goes on, um, if you need to do emergency feeding, if they start running out of honey, you can throw a piece of newspaper or wax paper on top of that and just dump regular cane or beet sugar on top of that newspaper, leaving some uh, room around the edges and bees can come up and start feeding on that. And a moisture in the colony is gonna get absorbed by the sugar. And if, and if the sugar gets hard, the bees don't care. It's actually better for them if there's a little more moisture in the sugar than it is, it's easier for it to eat it when there's a little moisture in it than when it's totally dry. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a great way to do moisture control and do emergency feeding. Um, and then we talked about um, using um, oxalic acid and, and drill. So this is another issue where you're purposely introducing moisture into the colony. Um, it's, it's, again, it's one of those things, anytime you treat bees with any sort of medication, there's always an upside and a downside. The upside is you're killing off the pest, the downside is whatever medication you're using or whatever method you're using is going to cause some stress for the bees because it's not something that they're normally used to being exposed to. So when you do the dribble method, you want to make sure your bees are in a tight cluster what starts to happen when it's about 50, when the outside temperature is 55 degrees or cooler, but you also don't want it to be so cold that when you expose them to this additional moisture that they can't rapidly get it off of them um, and dry off. If it's too cold outside, because you're, what you're doing with the dribbling method is you're trying to hit every bee in the colony with, the, with a little syringe filled with oxalic acid and, and one to one sugar water. So if, it, if you, you're not using a lot, we'll go over exactly how you do it, but um, it's still enough moisture and you're putting it on the bee's body that you've got to let them dry off. And if it's too cold, if it's below 35 degrees outside, they probably aren't gonna be able to cool off or dry off fast enough and it be a real problem. So the oxalic acid dribble method. So it naturally, it's a naturally occurring um, acid. It occurs in green leafy uh, plants. Um, probably a lot of people, I don't know, rhubarb leaves are considered toxic because there there's quite a bit of oxalic acid in them. Um, pretty much any green leafy plant has oxalic acid in it. So 
This is why they call it an organic treatment, because it literally does come from nature. So what you buy is, it's called wood bleach as well, but you're looking for 2.5% concentration. Um, it's really super cheap. Uh, the problem that you're actually gonna have is you're only using three and a half grams to make basically a, uh, that's 60 milliliters is more than you need to treat one colony of bees. So it's, it's actually difficult to find it in small quantities. It usually comes a half a pound or a pound at a time. So it's like a lifetime supply when you buy your thing of wood bleach at the hardware store or wherever. So, but it's, yeah, you just mix uh, three and a half grams with 60 milliliters of um, one to one sugar syrup like you would feed for your light syrup in the spring. Uh, that's about two ounces, two ounces of water. Yeah. How much a soda can is 355 milliliters, which is 12 ounces. It's about a sixth of that. So yeah, about two ounces of um, um, Our beekeeping president, uh, Jim Olson, bought himself one of those livestock syringes that's metered. <laughs> instead of instead of having one like that where you, you can still read what how much you know how much is in there. And so you're trying to do a dosage that's basically five milliliters per seam of bees. And so each place where there's you can where the bees cover the gap between two frames is a seam. So in this picture I counted as like 11 or 12 seams of bees. So, one seam, two seam, three seam, four seam, five seam, six seam, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So, maximum amount that you're going to use in a colony is 50 millimeters. So, because you have 12 seams of bees, I would dose that four milliliters per seam of bees. And then if, if you had fewer bees than that, you would use a maximum of five milliliters of that stuff for every seam of bees. So if it was just the bottom one that only has six, you'd only be using about 30 milliliters of your one-to-one um, -one sugar syrup and oxalic acid crystals in that. It's basically, you're try trying to get it on the bees themselves, not on the wooden wire. Does that make sense? Don't, you don't want to over-treat. Um, this is another treatment that can only be used when honey supers are on. That might change over time, um, but currently that's, that's the recommended thing. And it only kills the phoretic mites. Phoretic meaning it's, when you see the mite on the back of the bee, that's a phoretic mite. It's not currently feeding on the bee, it's just riding around. Um, so it's, oxalic acid is best used when there's no brood present, because that's how it kills. It's killing, it's not ever going to get into the brood chamber and kill um, mites in the brood nest, like Formic Pro does. But you can't use Formic Pro when it's 35 degrees outside. You can use oxalic acid drill when it's 35 degrees outside. <clears throat> Does that make sense? I, I see I got a minor spelling error there, but when I'm talking about a seam of bees, does that make sense? Okay. And where do you get the uh, silk? Um, like I said, you can, a lot of farm and home stores actually have it. You can, of course, you can get it on from Dayton or um, Better, Better Bee. Uh, B&B. Yeah, any of those. It's what wood bleach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this be. But again, the, the important thing is the formula that, that's up there, and, and again, if you go online, you can find that the information, but there are different, it's, it's like other types of bleach. I mean, when you talk about like regular household bleach, there's different concentrations of it. So you do need to be mindful of that 2.5% number. Um, 
Because that's what, any time I've, I've read about it, mixing this stuff up, they always reference the two and a half percent. But you can buy oxalic acid crystals that are more concentrated than that. And you could rest overdosing with those. Yeah, so do you like fumigating better, or you like drip method? I've done both. The problem I have, um, when I switch to double nukes, is the entrance is too small for me to put my oh. vaporizer in. But you don't have, either or does the same job. Right. Yeah. I actually like vaporization a little better because it's not limited by the temperature. Yeah, I mean, I've done vaporization when it was, you know, zero degrees outside, you know, just whenever I got time and go out in the middle of December or January and because it, it doesn't matter then. In fact, it works, it, all of these things work best with whether you're doing double or vaporization is they do need to be in a tight cluster, which again, if it's 55 or below, they're going to be in a tight cluster. If it's 35 or above, between that range, they're going to be in a tight cluster. Any other questions on triple method? It's a, it's a great way to clean up your, your winter colonies. Um, it's not, it's not going to cure your, like, a, like I said, if you hit that 3, 4, 5 percent threshold before you go into winter, this, you can do it, but there's enough damage been done to the bees that it may not help. It's a cheap, it's cheap enough method, though, it's, it's definitely worth trying. It's super, super cheap. So, the three W's are wrapping wind and water. Um, kind of circling back to the moisture thing again there with water. But uh, wrapping is a good practice to use when you don't have wind protection. And I kind of waited to talk about the, the wrapping and stuff until after I talked about treating with oxalic acid. So, because this is one of the considerations. If you're going to treat with oxalic acid and you're going to wrap, well, you better make darn sure that you made a way to get back into that colony. If you wrap it too tight, or if you make it too hard to get back in there, you're not going to be able to do winter inspections, late winter feeding, or oxalic acid dribble. So, if you don't have good wind protection, if your bees are exposed somewhere in a rural location, and they're just kind of sitting out on a plane, wrapping is probably a, a, I would recommend wrapping. Otherwise, if you can build a temporary um, windbreak, a lot of people use just some bales of straw and teeth posts. And they'll make basically, so if you got a roll of three or four hives here, you make uh, like a wedge that points to the north and west of where those hives are sitting. And you just put a couple of teeth posts up and then put your bales up and you keep them about six to eight feet away from the hive so that the, because the snow is going to land on the other side of them and you don't, you don't want them too close because then the snow will land right on the, on the hives. But you don't, if you have them too far away, then it's not a windbreak anymore. So that's the other thing you can do, just make it like a over the winter windbreak. Um, which again, is the wind is what really kills the bees with the cold. Um, they, they, it's like, like I said, it's like any other animal. You get them out of the cold, they can handle the cold, get them out of the wind. And don't let them get too much moisture. Um, so that's the other consideration too is I've seen people really go overboard um, with the wrapping of their hives. If you, get, you want it tight enough so the water can't get in, but you don't want it so tight that the water can't get out. That's really, really important. Yeah. So if you if I've got a lean to that's shelter on the north, actually the east, it's open on the south, and I put the bees in, I wouldn't need to wrap. I, I wouldn't think so. If you've got if you've got really good protection from the north and west already, I because I live in town and I have where I have my bees, I've got like a little four foot fence that's about six feet behind them. Plus, I live in, in the city, so the winds don't get real bad in the middle of the city anyway. But I don't wrap. When I lived in rural areas, I, I did. When I had bees out in, in fields and stuff like that, I would wrap. 
You don't want to get too carried away with the wrap. I just wrap mine with Rook and Tar paper. Yeah. We don't want to get big once inch lace around it and it's too much. Yeah. I've heard that. I've heard people have had better luck with just tar paper. I didn't know if that was because of the heat from the sun. Well, the heat from the sun also absorbs in that tar paper and yeah. it warms up that hive. So the bees will have a tendency to like break the cluster a little mm -hmm. more easily and go eat. Yeah. Instead of staying in the cluster, that, that tar paper warms that, the sun warms that up quicker. Yeah. yeah. And the bees will break cluster a little easier. Yeah. I was reading online and also watching videos and it was saying don't use tar paper because it causes more moisture. Hmm. Well again, I would, I would agree with that if you, especially if, if you wrap it too tightly and there's not a little bit of a gap, it, it, you could be sealing up every single hole in that hive, which again, you know, in the wild, bees would have overwintered in a dead out tree. You know, it, it, that's not real airtight. Um, it's out of the wind, but it's not airtight. Yep. Um, I actually did find um, a publication from the um, University of Minnesota and that does go over wrapping. So I think that's what's coming up. Yeah. So this is, if you're going to wrap, and again, one other thing I do want to make a comment on with the black tar paper or the black wrap, which is what they're doing here, is ask 10 beekeepers about something, you'll get 12 different answers. And um, this is one of those, here's the other side of this, is having these break cluster at certain points is really good. Because if they're, if they're starting to get to the point where they can't reach their honey anymore, you want them to break cluster. But if they keep breaking cluster all the time, they actually end up using more honey than they would be if they stayed in tight cluster. Um, the, the bees are most efficient at, at um, using their spores when it's about 45 to, uh, 35 to 45 degrees outside. If it gets much warmer than that outside, they tend to break cluster and start eating honey. If it gets much colder than that, they, they just end up having to spend more of their resources trying to stay warm. So having that black on the outside, if you can start making it feel like it's 60 degrees outside, they're going to break cluster and they're going to start eating. If you don't, you don't necessarily want them doing that in late November, early December, because they're going to start mowing through that honey store so they could run out before the end of winter. So there's there's a down there is a downside to wrapping with black. Hmm. Yeah. Say I move my bees under cover. Do the bees have any problem when they go on out cleaning, finding back which hive to go into? Because I've switched them all around. Um, well, if you move them, if I moved all six, seven hives in there, then I'm in trouble. I thought. Yeah. If I move one every. Four days or something. Yeah. Was that? No, I, I've shed? always thought a three-sided well, orient. A three-sided shed would be like the ideal place to keep bees in the winter because, especially if it's you know open to the south, because then they're still exposed to whatever outside air temperature is, but they're pretty well protected from the wind. So this is like I said. These are copied directly from a PDF file that is available from. Um, University of Minnesota, um, and they're, they're basically reinforcing a lot of things I've already said. I haven't talked about a young prolific queen, queen um, but they're talking about having enough honey stores. They're saying 75 to 90, I would say 80 to 100, uh, large population, and few mites. They don't, they don't go into very much detail on what few mites is. Maybe that's 2% or less. Um, and there, and again, this is University of Minnesota, so a little further north than we are. So for them, three deep might be a better way to go. I think for our area, unless you've got a lot of bees, that's a lot of space for them to eat. Um, and they're also recommending that you have holes that you use um, on all of the, the high bottom. And they actually use those for the, the, the opening for the upper entrance. So 
The top hole should be open and talk about closing. The other one's off, the forks or, or tape. Um, if, they're tape. if you don't have a hole there, put one below the handle. And they talk about using an entrance producer and uh, how the entrance producer are facing up. I mean, I don't know if you can see it from the slide very well there, but that means that the piece <coughs> is on the against the bottom board. And there's a really good reason for that. And this is another thing that um, is more like winter maintenance than winter preparation. But these are going to die from the cluster, and they're all going to fall down there. And they all start to end up clogging up that pipe entrance, which is why you want to turn that way instead of over, because what you could have happen there, you could have a layer of dead bees, and if this was if this opening was flipped over on the bottom, you could, that could be blocked by dead bees. Um, I, I go in periodically with a stick and scoop out dead bees. Real quick, back to the wrapping. Has anybody ever tried like tie that that would just that breathes but doesn't, you know, it seals off the house real good, but it breathes and lets moisture out? I don't know the answer to that. Probably somebody has. Yeah. They actually recommend uh, also using a moisture board. Um, the, it's called Bill or uh, yeah, Bill Bright B I L D. Right? It's three quarter inch sheet. It's basically like particle board um, that they put right above the um, air cover for moisture control. Um, and again, it just talks about the same thing I did is when they're uh, in cluster, they're giving off water vapor, and that has to have some place to go. You're going to try to vent some of it out, but you want some of it to. Uh, some of it's still going to stay in there. One of the other things that they don't recommend that they don't recommend that I do is I would actually put um, between between this piece and the telescoping cover, I would actually put a piece of foam there um, because what you're doing there is the coldest air is hitting that telescoping cover. If you put a piece of foam between that and your inner cover, then you're less likely to have that scenario where you have warm moist air that goes up, hits the top of that telescoping cover, and goes, oh, it's 20 degrees here. Let's turn to water. They don't, they don't recommend that in this, but that's something I would recommend doing is putting, um, but it, it's the last piece on for the telescoping cover. And it's just to insulate that from the cold air. Hey, Sean. Yeah. On, on my eyes, I need something a little different. <clears throat> I put your spacer in here, I build it in my top box. Well, not my top box, I got two brood boxes. And I take a, an old super box or a brood box mm -hmm. and I put a full screen on it. And I also space it up three quarters of an inch. So you got your food supply. Well, the full screen, and I fill it with three and a half inches of cedar wood chips, and I yep. go about four, four, four holes in each side. <clears throat> the wood chips allow the moisture to go right up through, yep. but it also insulates the hive. Yep. I do, I do something similar. Yep. That, there, that's the whole, again, go back to the whole, ask 10 beekeepers, you get 12 different answers. There's lots of different ways that you can uh, insulate and do moisture control. I'm just... That's, what, size, what size screen do you use? Oh, I'm just... Oh, I don't know. They call them, the other term for them is called quilt boxes. Quilt boxes. Yeah. I've done that as well, which is basically, they're a little taller. They're usually about three inches, and they've got screens on the front as well. And you fill them with anything, wood chips, leaves, um, could be gold, cotton, could be an old quilt. I, I use a door screen. Yeah. Because it's real fine, the bees can't get through it. But the problem is, I got you got to brace it the center up because otherwise you don't, you're just going to have a big dip in the middle. And again, that goes so. So I, I built my boxes that I have an extra board across the center, and I actually hold that screen up and staple it to another board up right, so it holds it up. So it all stays up and gives that three quarters of one inch space in there. So if I got to go in to feed, I lift it up, drop feed in, and close it back up. Yeah. So, 
It's easy to get out. You're not drilling a hole there on top. I have. I still have my top. I Are still have a hole through that top. My, my, my top box. I don't have anything holes in my brood box. But my, yeah. This box, I will put that hole front entrance or your front entrance up there. Oh, but I still have that. that, so the bees can still go in and out that. Okay. And that's below the screen. But then the holes in my box are for each side to let that air above the wood chips breathe. And that moisture, and if you put your hand on the wood chips, as you further go down in there, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. You can yeah. feel the difference in there. I heard if you use a queen excluder underneath that screen, that kind of works. For that would probably help hold the screen up then. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so. I, I'm trying to remember what this product is called, but um, again, this is University of Minnesota. This is what they do. Um, obviously, they, they they have a huge entomology department. They're actually world renowned for their <laughs> entomology and bee department at Minnesota University of Minnesota. So, if this is what they do, it probably works. Yeah, um, it's, it's kind of a wrap. You can buy that wrap. Yeah, this is a this is a commercial product. Yeah. Um, and but what they're doing is a little uh, kind of off market here because they're talking about cutting a, a hole here and using that upper high body hole as your upper entrance. Whereas for me, I just make sure that when you put the telescoping cover on, you got your foam board, and then you've got an inner cover that has a good three eighths inch opening in it for the bees to get out in the winter. And that's also for where the moisture comes out. Um, but this is a good product because it's it, uh, if you're into the whole black thing, it's going to help heat them up. It's corrugated, so it's really strong. It's going to offer some insulation, and of course, it's going to block the wind. And those can be used over and over and over again. Whereas if you use tar paper, you got to rip it off every year unless you're really careful. It's going to be awfully hard to reuse. Um, so then. Put your top cover on, um, and then they talk about cocking the cover too, which would mean like putting like a shim or something under the top cover, and then make sure there's a rock on it, keep it from blowing off. And that's and you notice though that they're keeping the bottom part of the hive completely open. They did well; they're putting the entrance reducer on, but they're not having that um, wind protection come all the way down. Because they, again, the idea is the bees are all going to be up. They're going to work their way up uh, towards the end as winter goes on. They're going to end up, when, the, when it's coldest and windiest, they're already going to be up into the black. You shouldn't have to visit until March. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that. And then they also show this little optional uh, landing pad here. And even a little, they put a, a little cardboard wood block by the hole itself, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, so again, you know, they've got lots of bees that they do this for, so, and I think this is a fairly recent document, I think it was produced in 2012 or 2013, and they haven't updated it, this is where I got it, it was from. Uh, blab.umn.edu. So, any questions on wrapping? Because again, there's there's tons of different ways to do it. I, but I wanted to show something that was done by a you know published university. That so yeah. I was thinking of using after I did the research and I was saying not to use tar paper, then I was starting to think about using foam board on the outside, like insulation board. Is that too much for around here? It's, it probably would be okay. It's, it's just to get it hard. It's going to be hard to get it to attach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We use the phone. That's what I do. Okay. How do you attach it to your your hives? <laughs> just like the or is it wrap? Yeah. Just wrap. <laughs> put a, put some tape around it. Yeah. Duct tape around it. Paint some yeah. paper. Split it out over the top. Of it. I also don't have stands for my hives. I just put them on pallets. Is that high enough up off of the ground, or what do you do? I would with say that? most of the time, yes, pallets are high enough. However, two years ago, when I had my bees on pallets in my yard, and we had a lot, a lot of snow, 
in late winter, and my whole backyard was filled with snow, and then it all started to melt. And again, remember I told you I had this fence around yeah. my property, and all the water would normally drain off towards the fence, except that there was snow jam, there was ice jams under all all that. So my whole backyard in uh, early, was it late March, early April, flooded, and I had literally bees. You know, the the, the water was up high enough that it was coming up six inches off the ground because you got a pallet like this and then the high entrance is a little higher than that. <coughs> Water that high. I had to go out in my boots and lift hives off of pallets to get them out for the water. So normally, yes. <laughs> yeah. Two cinder blocks on your pallet. But that's the first time that's ever happened with you. Well, underneath the pallet? Underneath, on top of the pallet and then your bottom board on top of the cinder blocks. And if you put the solid side of the cinder block uh, towards the opening, the sun will keep the snow and ice from melting. Yeah. It'll do past the solar. And it'll keep that bottom entrance and stuff open up. And it'll keep you high enough off the ground, very stable. So yeah, the solid was, outwards? Yep. Okay. That was one of the things I think I neglected to mention that was part of the slide was that's also part of that whole moisture control thing for winter is you got to consider where the snow is going to melt. And just like you place your hives any other time, you want to make sure they're a little bit of an angle so that any water that does get onto the hive is going to run out instead of back in. Um, same, same kind of deal. So we, we already talked about um, mites and we talked about oxalic acid. I do want to talk about Formic Pro because I do think that those are probably our two best mite treatments. And amazingly enough, you could probably still be using Formic Pro right now. In fact, I am. Uh, because our daytime temperatures are still really good. Uh, it has to be above uh, 50 or above, but below 85. Um, and again, Formic Pro is another organic compound that was found in nature. And again, I did a little research, and the Latin name for ant is Formica, which ants produce formic acid. So that's where it comes. I mean, obviously, it's now commercially made. It's made in a laboratory or in a, but it's the same thing. It's this, the chemical composition is the same as as it would be uh, on an ant, um, and it all comes down to dosage. So, uh, formic acid is more toxic to the brawl mite than it is to the honeybee. However, it is still toxic and it still does damage. Can do damage to honeybees, which is why all the label instructions talk about using it. With, um, the temperatures are below 85. Uh, and, it's, and again, if you use Formic Pro, even if you're wearing a respirator, <laughs> it's nasty, nasty smelling stuff. You don't want to, you don't want to breathe it in because it can damage your lungs. It is, it's nasty. But it kills mice and it kills, it penetrates the into the brood chamber. It's the only product that does that. It's the only product that you can use when you have honey supers on. That's why it's kind of my go-to thing. Um, I've had really good luck with it. Um, there's two ways that you can treat. You can do what they call a full treatment, which is two of the gel patties that you put on and leave on for 14 days. Or you can do uh, two 10-day treatments with, a, with one patty each for those treatments. And I think that's probably okay if your mite loads are marginal. I mean, if you just start to get into that, close to that 3% range, if you're at like six, seven, eight, nine mites per 300, probably doing a half treatment is fine. It's going to be a lot less hard on the bees. Um, and especially if you're a little concerned about daytime temperatures going too high, I would do the half treatment. Um, but you need to pull that off on day 10 and then put that other treatment on right away. So it's a little more intensive. The, the, the full treatment where you put the two patties on and leave them on for 14 days, it's, you want to take them off as soon as you can, but if another <coughs> week goes by, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's, it's supposed to be completely biodegradable. They look really shriveled up um, when you take them out. 
There's not actually a lot of it left. That could be the last you kind of deteriorate them and drag yeah. them out, too. Yeah. But it's, you're better, to, they, they recommend on the label to take them out. So that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I just put um, Formate Pro on my hives this last weekend. Um, the two, I, the two treatment one, or the one treatment one, and both pads. Well, I could get pretty strong. It's a little, in the, again, it's a little different. You hurt your bees pretty good and lose your queen. It's yeah, like, it's a little different too when you're using double nukes. So a full treatment for them <laughs> is one patty on each side. Um, so that's what I, that's what I do for my double nukes. Again, another reason for the plug for the double nuke: use half as much stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, you only need one patty to treat your. One side of the double nuke. Yeah. How did you do the honey supers with your double nuke, like the double nuke like that? I put a queen excluder on above, and then just put a regular 10 frame equipment above it. I produced all my honey this year by doing that method in, in years past. And they don't. And then you got two colonies producing honey for you instead of one. Really? And they're all going into one super. Yeah. So what I do, like I said, you put a queen excluder, and then I put another. I put an inner cover on top of that. Um, so that there's an entrance there, and then all the field bees just, they don't care. If, the thing is, when a field bee comes back carrying honey, this is how, this is how drifting occurs. They, you come in with a load of nectar, come on in! We don't care who you are! They only get defensive when they try to rob or do other things. And, you know, and since you've got a queen excluder, queen's down here, they're going in here to put the honey in. Or if they come in through their bottom entrance, then they're working all the way up and putting the honey up there. And other people have said the same thing. Um, what well, actually I'm gonna sidetrack real quick here. So I'm gonna be going to <coughs> the Iowa Honey Producers Association annual meeting. Um, I'm really excited for one of the speakers who's gonna be there. I don't know if you guys do a lot of stuff on YouTube. There's a guy named Cayman Reynolds. Anybody heard of Cayman Reynolds? He's actually from Kentucky or Tennessee, but he's, he's another really great speaker, does a lot of good stuff. Um, I did most of my learning on Queen Marie from him. Um, and anyway, uh, he, he did a video on how he produced hundreds of pounds of honey with basically a, a two hot body setup and then quitting splitter and five or six supers on top of it. So it because some people call it a honey excluder. And it was basically, okay, really? Is that a honey excluder when I produce two hundred pounds of honey on this colony? Now he's in Tennessee or Kentucky, which is anyway, a little little further south. But still. Anyway, the other thing to circle back to Formic Pro or any of the other treatments, if possible, you want to do a follow up check to see how effective your treatment was. So if you were at that 7, 8, or 9 mites in 300, you did the treatment, 14 days have gone by. At some point, probably within 14 days after the treatment ends, do a follow up check to see how effective it was. It's always a good idea. I do, it, starting in May or April, if I can, is when I start doing my mic checks. I do one as early as I can in the spring. I'll do two in May, three in June, three in July. Now, you don't have to check every hive in your acre. Um, when I had, so I started out, I had eight hives when I started out this year, and I would check two each two to four each time I would do my checks. And then, because they're all in the same bee yard, as long as my mite numbers were low, I didn't treat. When I started seeing high mite numbers on two of them, I just assumed every, if, if everybody started out low, and then later in the year, I'm starting to count more in, in two of them, that they probably all have a similar mite load. But overall, I end up checking each, each colony at least 
three to four times each year. It's it's not fun, but it's really it's really really important to keep ahead of the mites. Uh, all you can't wait until August or September to control the mites. You have to really kind of by spring. You have to be you got to keep under control of the spring already. Yeah, lose a slide or two here because if you don't, you don't let your mites go under control. By the time you hit that August. Your bee numbers are down, but your mite load is so high by then that it doesn't matter what you do, you've probably got virus in your hives. So if you can keep them knocked down before you get into summer, the more you can, the better off you are. So I did have two more slides, but I remember what I put on there. So it's basically a recap of, you know, condense, crown, and co combine so that you get, you got a viable colony. Again, larger populations in a smaller area do better uh, for overwintering. And then especially if you make sure that they have plenty of honey and that honey is in a location that they can get to. Um, you, it's one of the few times where you really want to do a lot of manipulation in the hive is to make sure that you move all those honey frames up. And if you haven't started already, if you're if you're Bees don't have enough honey, start feeding immediately, if not sooner. I use a, a four, or five gallon chicken water that I put my two to one syrup out in the backyard, and I've gone, in the last 10 days, I've gone through eight gallons of that, okay. which is about, um, well, it weighs almost as much as honey. So that's about 90 some pounds worth of syrup in. 13 colonies. That's two cups of sugar to one cup of water? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, you can, yeah, you can do it either by volume or by, um, by weight. And I always just estimate a gallon of water is eight pounds. Um, you know, so each pint is a pound, roughly. Yeah. Um, and then, make sure that you know what your mite count is going into winter because that's going to, if you've done, like I said, if you've done everything else right, your other key factor of success is where your mite count is at going into winter. Know what that is because I tell you, if you're, if you're somebody like me who teaches this and then, you know, one of the things that we teach uh, late in the spring is, you know, why did my bees die? And the number one, the first question is, what was your mite count going into winter? I don't know. Well, my answer is going to be, well, it probably died because you had too many mites. I mean, there are ways to figure that out. Um, there, there's actually forensic evidence that you can find inside of a colony that well, you can prove that they died from mites. You'll actually find uh, the uric acid crystals in the, in the comb of the mites. It's kind of gross. But, yeah. And especially if there's, hey, they still have food. It doesn't look like they got too much moisture. Well, my bees are all died. Probably, probably mites. So that's that's always good. You can, like I said, you can do a cleanup with mites uh, if they're uh, not way above that two or three percent threshold. You can use oxalic acid, uh, vaporizer method, or the dribble method. It's a good way to clean them up. Um, and. Uh, Wrap them if you need to. Wrap them if you got them. Uh, and uh, make sure that you're controlling ventilation and moisture. So the last slide that I had was, I wanted, like I said, we, and we can talk about this with some other questions, but our group um, has contacted a woman named uh, Ellen Bell, who I believe is from... South of the Morning. Yeah, South of the Morning. Morning. And she is going to lead a class on queen rearing. So this is going to be kind of a hybrid class because there's a lot of information that you need to know. I actually took the queen rearing course at University of Minnesota back in 2005, but it was this was the first year that I ever actually had a chance to I had enough time, I had enough bee colonies, had enough money to buy the stuff that I needed to do it. 
that I kind of that I first dipped my foot into the queen room. And it is very complicated. You have to have a lot of experience in keeping bees. You need to know everything about the stages of brood. You need to be able to make splits. You need to be able to successfully requeen, all those kinds of things. So it's not it's not like a beginner class, it's definitely an advanced class. And so, and even with that, we're going to do, um, in a couple of weeks before we actually do the grafting, she's going to lead some Zoom classes where we cover all this stuff that you need to learn before you try to graft queens. So, and then we're going to be setting up uh, an apiary where we set up um, what are called the cell builder colonies, which is basically a hive that you specially manipulated so that when you put your grafted queen cells in there, they go straight to them and they just jack them full of royal jelly so that you get really great quality queens. It takes, again, it takes a lot of experience, a lot of bees, and a lot of manipulation to do that. And so that's what gets covered in the Zoom part of the class. And then we don't have a set location for this yet, but it will probably be um, in Milford. We have a member uh, of our group, uh, his name is Jim Craninger, and he has, him and his partner Marlene um, have uh, 400 to 500 colonies of bees that they keep there. Um, and they send them to California for home pollination. Um, and so they have a really big bee yard with, but we're still trying to work out the details of how we're going to get all of the required resources to do the cell builders. And it's going to also depend on how many people are interested in taking the class. But it'll all build up to, um, on Saturday, which is June 4th, will be grafting day, so you'll actually come physically to the location, you'll get to see what was set up that we talked about in the Zoom classes. People will be set up to graft uh, queens, or uh, eggs into queen cells, queen cups, and then we'll be placing them into the cell builders, and then you just take them out the next morning. Literally that fast is how quickly they, they go into that. You need to put them into a finisher later, but that's, again, that's part of the learning curve of figuring out how to raise queens. So I'm sure there's probably people who are interested in that, and I'd like you to contact me if you are. And then once we have more of the details worked out, um, I would get back with you and let you know. So we, our our group, has been talking about doing something like this for well since I started working for came back to the area in 2015. Uh, I started attending meetings in the summer of 2015. Um, We've been talking about, I am so darn tired of buying packages of bees. Mm -hmm. Well, this is part of what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get beekeepers to be more self-sufficient and sustainable so that you can raise your own queens. Now, so I hope uh, that piques your interest. And if you've got other questions about preparing your uh, bees for fall or winter, I can take some questions. Just real quick, I, I, the way I'm set up, I've got uh, six hives on a trailer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can either pull them in behind a shed to keep them out of the wind, I don't have to worry about wrapping them, or I can set them out in a field right beside my house. Yeah, so anywhere where there's good... There'd be more sun in that field. Right? They, won't, they wouldn't get much sun behind the shed. Yeah, that's probably not that. It's more, like I said, I really think it's more important to get them out of the wind. Then I wouldn't have to wrap them. I wouldn't, I oh, don't try it, but yeah. I have a place where they're out of the wind. How far can you move a trailer full of bees? Well, I can still use the two foot, two mile rule, which is if you move bees two feet, they don't need to do a reorientation flight. If you move them more than two feet, but less than two miles, they won't do a reorientation flight and they'll fly back to where they think their colony is. If you move them two miles, when they come out, there's, it's like, uh, well, we're not in Kansas anymore, uh, and then we'll start doing orientation flight.